Hey guys, welcome to another Trade Genius Podcast. Bob and Phil here as always. Guys, we have an analog to show you guys. Pretty scary stuff. It's actually something that a very wealthy investor used once to call a market crash. You're not going to want to miss this. We could be looking at a potential market event in just a few weeks. Let's dive in. Trade Genius. So Bob, you know, I think people were looking at 2008 as a potential pattern that we were following. And then we kind of broke away from that. But really what hasn't broken off is this pattern that we're going to show these guys here in a second. Yeah, so the pattern we're looking at is the, um, is the 1987 market crash. And Phil, you know, before I get into that, we're going to jump back and forth a lot today, guys, is that you had a really interesting story about how probably one of the most famous investors was prepared for that crash. And you want to share that story real quick? That was really interesting. Yeah, so Paul Tudor Jr. Jones, actually, you know, if you don't know who that is, you can Google him. Very well-known investor, a very successful investor. But he actually did a, I think it was a documentary, Bob, in the in the late 80s. It was after the 87 crash. And he basically was, when they were doing the documentary on him, they were saying how they found that the stock market in the 20s was closely tracking what was going on in the stock market in the 80s, which is a late 80s is when they did that documentary and so they were actually positioned for the 87 stock crash because of the pattern that was holding uh, on a weekly chart i think it was of uh, compared to the 20s to the uh, compared to the 80s and, and what's interesting is that this chart here i guess we'll just slide right into it is doing the same exact thing here bob and the scary thing is that you know we've got you know you know what happened in the 20s i mean we had the great depression and um so this is really, you know, unnerving when you look at it because this hasn't deviated. Like the 2008 analog kind of deviated. This hasn't deviated. But, you know, Tudor Jones was, after the documentary was done, he was so sure that, you know, he was onto something. He actually tried to buy up all of the copies that had been produced. At this time, it was produced to VHS. Of course, they were marketing to a niche audience, you know, traders. And, and trading isn't like now where, you know, retail trading was was a very niche thing if, if people were doing it at all. So this was probably more like banking uh, traders and things like that. But anyway, he went out and tried to gobble up all of the, all of the copies of those uh, documentaries because he felt that he let the cat out of the bag when it was all said and done and uh but it, but anyway he did buy a lot of them some of them made it out and it, i think you can find it on youtube you know the analog did play out to an extent and they actually were positioned for that 87 stock crash so analogs do work and they work until they don't and right now the thing that's coming up here you can see on the chart there bob it looks uh it looks pretty scary and we're coming up to within a few weeks now where it's do or die time yeah and what we want to tell you guys today look our whole purpose today isn't uh, isn't necessarily clickbait, although hopefully that you came to see this, is really to actually identify if the crash will occur or not. The thing about the 1987 crash is that they were having issues with the dollar. And so we're at this point now where there's some weird Forex moves too. But right. we don't have to worry about any of that. You got to keep things really simple. And Phil, if we throw up the, the other chart that we put together for these, these folks is that your first warning that something's going to go awry is when the the, the price of the S&P 500 or SPX is the easiest one. If it, if you get a break below the 50-day moving average, okay? We like Trade Genius, we use the nine-week EMA, but most people use the 50-day SMA. So dealer's choice on that. But if you break the nine-weekly EMA or you break the daily 50 SMA, you're going to trigger some institutional selling. And then the second one is where you want to just, you know, hug your wife and kick your dog is, is you want to... Watch the August low. If that breaks, then then we're in for a sharp market, you know, correction. I mean, a quick correction. You know, it doesn't have to be the 87, 27 point some percent one day crash. But we've had in the past in 2019, which we're setting up really interesting financially the same way. We'll talk about that in our uh, some of our other podcasts this week. Is that you can get an 18 percent correction in, in two or three weeks. And right. so we want to prepare you for the fact of what what I would just call utter institutional failure. And look, they've been playing a really, really, really sick game here by using a lot of leverage. All right. They know what everybody's watching. They have more chips at the table than you do. And they can blow out people until there's enough momentum that they can't blow them out anymore. And then they basically reverse. And so that's kind of my positioning on this, Phil. The other thing I'll say, too, before I throw it back to you, is that uh, Jerome Powell has thrown five trillion dollars. Well, et al., the elites, uh, there's no difference between these guys, have thrown 
five trillion dollars into the U.S. economy to produce two and a half million fewer jobs than before COVID. Okay, with people extremely stressed and strained now fiscally, which we'll talk about later this week as well, Phil. So, you know, what say you on that? What what would you be looking at? You know, from levels because you're more of a levels trader than I am. I'm more of a momentum trader. I'd mm-hmm. like to get your thoughts on that. Sure. So obviously, you know, if you look at the red line there on the chart, that's the 50 day moving average. And we were actually in a pretty perilous spot there as we bottomed off of the August low around mid August. And then we came up and we tested that moving average from below. Now, classic technical analysis trading would tell you that you're looking for a rejection when you push up into a moving average from below. And just, and that's what we got. We had that big uh, red bearish engulfing candle back down. However, the bulls came roaring back. And a lot of this is got to do with seasonality as well. The back half of August tends to be bullish. The front half tends to be bearish. So there was some seasonality in play here. And we are in a bullish window until mid-September or so, where things then get very volatile historically, uh, especially now we're in a window where VIX, the volatility index, typically goes up quite a bit through September and October. So I think we got a bit of seasonality that came into the rescue here, as well as, you know, this market is so dependent on the option hedging flows and those also become more market positive or bullish uh, from the first into the first two weeks of September. So I think we had a little bit of that playing a part. There was a major stick save by the bulls there. So where do we go from here? Well, if you look at the top there, I have a line at the highs at 4607 on the S&P 500 index. I would be very cautious if we were to probe back up there, Bob, especially on a daily basis. Let's say we poke our head above there, we make a new high, and then over the next couple of days, we come back inside that high and come back under that upper black line. That is what you would call a failure up there. Uh, and so then you would look for that high, that new high that's made to hold. You know, basically, you would be, you know, your stops would be above that. Why? Because you made a higher high, but you're also failing at a prior swing high. So on a weekly basis, you could call that a potential swing failure. So it's your risk reward is really good there. And if you do get a weekly close back below that level, then you kind of have further confirmation. You might be on to a large uh, pivot. And especially if we look at the seasonality, let's say that happens going into OPEX, then you now have a window of weakness because the fuel that was there to push that, th- those hedging fuel that was there to push up into OPEX is now removed. Hey guys, if you guys don't mind, head over to tradegenius.co, check out our specials we have over there. There's a number of different specials with different packages for all different experience types. If you're more into education, we have a package for that. If you'd just like to get into the room, primarily, we have a package for that as well, where you can see where we're calling out trades and things like that live, and also posting signals into our Discord signal rooms. So check it out, tradegenius.co, appreciate you doing that. And you get a little bit of an air pocket underneath and it pushes down. Then at that point, if the 50 day moving average doesn't hold from above, which let's just say it would be somewhere around 4480 to 4490 at that point and if that breaks then i think you're definitely looking at those august lows that we just put in at 4335 to get taken out and then your first big target will be the midpoint of our big range from last year's lows down at 4040 uh, let's call it 4050 on the s p 500 so that is a real simple way to look at the markets in the next two weeks bob yeah, and the other thing too, guys, is that they pushed the VIX back down to 13. Mm-hmm. And so the one thing, you know, people ask me all the time, Bob, once I go long the VIX, long the VIX, I always tell them never go long the VIX, except when it gets to about 13. Then right. the risk rewards in your favor. And so we pushed back down to 13. The other thing too for me, which is interesting, is that typically Friday into a three-day weekend tends to be pretty bullish. And we almost bearish right. golf the Thursday move. We had Thursday, Friday red. Now I'm not calling for next week because I kind of agree with you that uh i think maybe the market on wednesday got a little or tuesday got a little bit ahead of itself Mm -hmm. and so i just take that as that these guys bolted out early and they uh they ran it up and killed the shorts but right you know we're basically running out of fuel for a a major liftoff here now having said that phil i want you to kind of explain when you and i are talking doing this little pre-meeting talk here is that Yellen's playing a very dangerous game and she's making a really big bet. And so far, every time she's employed it, it has worked for her. Mm -hmm. But I think she's running out of chips. You want to explain what she's doing? So, yeah, the T-bill issuance, which is strictly short-dated bond or a short-dated debt, right, that the government, the Treasury issues, right? It's all about what the Treasury is issuing and, you know, what the market's doing with that. So when it comes to T-bills, T-bill, if you hear like a lot of T-bills are being issued versus bond, 
bonds or coupons or, or notes. The coupons and notes are, are what the longer duration stuff is. T-bills is almost equivalent to cash. And so it's very easy for market participants, it's institutional participants to take that and leverage it. And it's not uncommon for them to use like 7X leverage on those. And so, and because they use them as they pledge them as collateral. And like I said, because of the short term nature of the T-bills, um, they're almost as good as just cash. So when you are in an environment, and this has been the case since the debt ceiling, where it's almost just been solely T-bills, the, the ratio has almost been 100% T-bills. Not quite, but but it's been extreme like that. And we've so we've been doing that since the debt ceiling was lifted back in June. And because of that, the reverse repo balances have been drawing down because they're absorbing some of that. So think of the reverse repo balances as an inverse relationship to the market. So if the reverse repo is drawing down, the market goes up. And that's really, it's come down to that right now. Whatever the reverse repo balances are doing, the market is having an inverse relationship to that. Now, when does that change? So historically, you don't have such a lopsided issuance of short dated debt. So we are going to go back to longer term debt issuance. That starts in uh, in earnest in Q4, but I think we're going to start seeing more of it toward the end of this month. Now that coincides with a uh, seasonality that gets really bearish. So I would say from the back half of this month through October into November, you got to be very, very, very careful. And this is also a same, if you think about what happened in 2007, same window where we topped out, I'm sorry, 2008, where things got extremely rocky. The last time we had another rocky episode, this time was 2018, end of 2018, going into 2019, extremely rocky. You can have very, very quick market drops. And you, next thing you know, you're back under 4,000s in, into the upper 30, uh, 3,000, 3,900, 30, 800 and you're now all of a sudden the bull market looks like it might be toast so and this thing can happen really quickly over the course of a couple of weeks because of all of that because there's this false sense of security because Yellen's essentially been pumping this market with a sort of quasi QE uh, because of the way she's been issuing debt she can't do that anymore because they simply just can't afford to be solely doling out short-term debt it's they, it's literally they can't afford to do that uh, and repay that debt so they do have to go back to longer term uh, debt issuance here over the next few weeks. Yeah, and two more things and we'll let you guys go is that, number one, nobody's expecting this, okay? Everybody's looking at seasonality, presidential seasonality and saying, we're going to have a slight little dip here and there in September, October, and then we're going to launch into the end of the uh, end of the year. That is a red flag, number one, because nobody's prepared for it, okay? Mm -hmm. When people like us talk, get trolled mercilessly, you guys don't do, do much because we show you the data, but the other thing too is something happened last week that's going to be a uh, is going to be a uh, black swan the banks have to add and add debt to their balance sheets to generate cash to hold on their books okay because we showed you guys last week this thing's blowing up on the uh, the btf thing well who's gonna buy all this debt folks that means that it's going to cause some issues in the bond market. And when the bond market gets disturbed, uh, the stock market uh, catches pneumonia. So watch out for volatility in the bond market, which would equate to the sharp moves in the stock market. Guys, too, you know, for us, we don't care. Phil and I don't care because we, we trade what's in front of us. But we will want to warn you if you have long term accounts, if you start seeing these things happen, you need to prepare yourself because a 20 percent correction over a couple of weeks. That puts you two years behind the eight ball. And, you know, and if you're over 50 years old, you know, we're going into a secular stagnation. You may not be able to make it up until you retire. So I'd rather hold cash if these things break, and I will, and then take advantage of, of lower prices here as they present themselves. But if not, we break a new high and we keep running from here, then we're happy to be wrong too. But be warned. Forearmed is forewarned, okay? And really appreciate you guys, and hope you had a great, great um, Labor Day weekend and uh, we'll talk to you guys on Tuesday. See you guys later. Bye-bye. Trade Genius.